everyone. Welcome to our Geo for Good Lightning Talk series. This month marks our sixth round and the theme this month is forest and nature. My name is Tanya Birch and I'm a program manager on the Google Earth Outreach team working on our forest and nature initiatives. So last year we started a series of monthly lightning talks by and for nonprofits, scientists and other change makers who wanna leverage mapping tools and technology for positive impact in the world. This week, our Forest and Nature Talks, we're featuring 10 scientists who are innovating to protect, manage, and restore nature in local and global communities. If you missed Tuesday's talks, they're now available on the geo for good platform. So we hope these three to five minute talks will inspire you to think about new ways that you can have an impact with our mapping tools or provide operational or practical tips and tricks to improve and optimize your workflows. I'm really excited today to welcome uh, to these speakers, Ricardo Abad, Andrew Trulisa, Pedro, v Ped uh, Pedro Rodriguez uh, Vega, Jen Hurd, and Dave Theobald. So before we kick off the first presentation, I'd like to call your attention to two things. First is the Q&A feature. If you're watching live, you can write your question in the Q&A section below this, um, below this page. And if you have a specific question for one of the speakers, please make sure to call out the name of the name of the speaker who you want to direct your question to, uh, and then write your question in the Q and A section. And then second is the link to the slides, which you can find below the resource section. So let's get started. Our first talk is Ricardo Abad. Ricardo is at the Instituto Socioambiental in Brazil and he's going to be presenting the Eye on the Shingu. Hello and welcome. Uh, as I said before, my name is Ricardo Abad, and I'm here on behalf of Instituto Socioambiental and also the Shingu Plus Network, which is a network composed of over 20 different indigenous associations and representing over 30 ethnic groups and their objective, one of the objectives is to protect the Xingu River Basin and its social environmental diversity corridor. Uh, it's over 500,000 square kilometers, large area, and we detect, report, and denounce illegal deforestation. So here you can see uh, the protected area corridor in uh, purple and the areas where we have offices in Altamira, Pará, and Canarana, Mato Grosso, and also the ethnic groups that we have worked close since uh, 2018 with the deforestation monitoring system. So the Kayapós, the Ikpeng, Panará, Waura, Kisej, and Kalapalo. So our Sirachi's uh, monitoring system is composed of three main components. The first being the mapping components where we use the Google Earth Engine to produce uh, image mosaics from different satellites. So we use uh, Sentinel-2 and Landsat 8 for multispectral color composites, but we also use Sentinel-1 radar multi-temporal color composites. Then we use our local GIS uh, to access the XYZ tiles, which are generated in Google Earth Engine and exported to the Google Cloud Storage. And once we have deforestation detected, we generate our reports uh, and statistics to identify the critical areas. And we contact our partners in the local uh, areas to, um, to report and communicate uh, mobilizing our different media channels. So this is a big uh, gap now is uh, where we need to grow is to have more people on our network. And finally, uh, we denounce uh, with technical information, uh, formal complaints to the state authorities. And, and we keep a track on these legal inquiries so we know how much, how effective these inquiries are uh, being. Okay, so here's an example of our script on Google Earth Engine, and all of our scripts are available. If you are interested, uh, please contact me on my email. Uh, a retrospective of 2021, uh, we had 21 formal judicial denunciations, and um, three of them were for land grabbing, two for selective logging, 
four for illegal mining, uh, six for illegal uh, clear-cut deforestation and land-grabbing recurrences, and uh, finally, one for Bellomonte's negligence in, comp in the compensation program, the Bellomonte River Dam. So for next year, for this year, our next steps uh, is to continue capacity building on mapping and communication tools with our local partners, uh, to increase internet connectivity in the remote areas, and to identify other critical areas in the Amazon to promote the same networking strategy. For uh, this year, uh, we are focusing on these three regions in the Xingu River Basin, which uh, uh, seem to be the most critical areas in 2020. And uh, they really propose a real threat to the connectivity and to the livelihood of the indigenous and riverine communities. So from the Shingu Network, uh, thank you. And uh, until next time. Hi, Ricardo. Thanks for joining us live. And thanks so much for your incredible talk and your incredible work. Um, your work to monitor this illegal activity in a protected area is so critical. And oftentimes we think about the establishment of a protected area as the end in and of itself. Um, and while, as your work shows, it's a critical milestone, um, you demonstrate the need for constant monitoring of activities, whether they be extractive or, you know, illegal activities um, or protecting the interest of indigenous people who live there, like the Shingu. And it got me to thinking, you know, if, if only all protected areas were measured in, or monitored in this way and, you know, had, had a team like, you know, your folks, uh, your team um, and in partnership with indigenous people uh, to monitor these these protected areas. Um, do you have any advice for other folks who wish to replicate or adapt some of your work? Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, it's very important, but uh, for you to have uh, build trust with your local partners, and they're very. Uh, excited about new technologies in using new technologies to monitor their areas. Unfortunately, in Brazil, we have a big enemy right now, which is the government. So the, the big advice that I give is to uh, put this uh, information to, uh, to these local communities because uh, they are eager uh, for this information. Unfortunately, also, we have very uh, uh, low connectivity, internet connectivity in the Amazon, which is a big problem. But uh, that that with new technology, that's starting to uh, uh, fade away. Great, thank you so much. And a, re a reminder to our uh, live audience: if you do have questions, please type them um, below the uh, below the page, below the video player, and you can ask your own question to all of our speakers, including Ricardo. So next up, um, we have Andrew Trelisa, who is a research scholar at the um, Forest Productivity Cooperative at North Carolina State University. He studies loblolly pine leaf area index from Sentinel-2 in the Southeast US. Let's hear his talk. Thanks, sir, that introduction. Um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, the work that we're doing. It's a kind of a tiny piece of this much larger question of the relationship of humans to land in an era of climate change. And one of those little pieces um, is how do we use the data that we've got to better inform uh, how we're managing timberland to produce the wooden paper and fuel that we depend on. Um, so our group does research specifically in managed uh, pine forests in the U.S. Southeast. And those are dominated by a particular kind of tree called loblolly pine. Um, trees from this forest are a major part of the global supply chain for wood and fiber and biofuel. Uh, but they only make up about 4% of the total forest area, even in the United States. And this is because loblolly pine is incredibly productive. Um, a well-managed stand can go from seedling to ready to harvest in as little as 10 years. Um, as a result of this high output, the room that you're sitting in right now or the paper you've handled today, there's a reasonably strong chance that some of this has come from a loblolly forest at some point. And this is important because these intensively managed forests like this um, 
help to keep pressure off of harvesting wood and fiber from other more sensitive um, forest ecosystems, say like tropical rainforests that are performing ecosystem services we really care about, like uh, biodiversity preservation or carbon sequestration. So it's kind of worth thinking about these forests as being treated and managed a lot like a crop field. And you can see from this picture here, they kind of look like a crop. Um, and like crops, they're often managed, say, like with fertilizer to make them grow, uh, encourage faster growth. However, the people maintaining these forests unlike in agriculture, um, very often don't have as much information on the status of their trees what, and what they might need for maximum growth, in particular in their canopy where the leaves are. Um, a metric we're very interested in is a metric called leaf area index because it can especially inform how much a given stand of trees might benefit from say fertilizer input. Um, we can use aerial LIDAR, so something like this, um, to measure this quantity of LAI, but um, these flights tend to be costly and as a result, um, they're not very often used uh, by many timber managers if they're used at all. Um, what that means is that timber managers are often flying blind when they're making stand decisions about how to manage their stands. So our goal was to develop tools using the Sentinel-2 record to give us a kind of free access synthetic LIDAR that would, get, that would be accessible to foresters who could then use it to make better management planning decisions along the way. So what we had was a wealth of LIDAR data from 2018. Um, that was flown over thousands of hectares of land in uh, over Loblolly Pine in the U.S. Southeast. We fed this as training data uh, into a custom-built uh, convolutional neural network that our uh, collaborators made in uh, TensorFlow and Keras, and um, paired that with the Sentinel data for using Earth Engine, and then um, trained it all. And uh, we now hand that model over to AI platform to do the number crunching and then Earth Engine to get the maps for visualizing and exporting out. Um, for the people that are interested in uh, the model architecture, it's it's there, it's a, a six layer thing that does um, convolution, spectral convolution and spatial spectral convolution to get us these um, estimates. We also are actually using an ensemble of 10 models that are trained in parallel so that we get you know 10 independent um, estimates out is so that gives us also an uncertainty estimate as well and basically means that we can get a 10 meter resolution lai map for anywhere um, that has sentinel 2 coverage so for the southeast united states this is anywhere from 2018 forward um, what that gives us is it brings us into range of, for more data-driven management of these kind of lot bullet forests. So that uh, leftmost panel there uh, shows how our neural network does in terms of its accuracy against our validation data. We get a much better fit to validation data than any other approach that we've previously seen demonstrated, which means that we our LAI estimates should be close to the LIDAR, should be you know, closer to what we're looking for. Um, what you're looking at in the middle is a zoom in of a uh, set of stands that we looked at in East Texas starting in 2018 and going forward annually. Um, you can see that these are very dynamic landscapes. You can see newly cleared forests that are planted and that they're harvested and then recovering. Um, you can see thinning activities. And in particular, you can see places on the map that look like they might well be underperforming and could use fertilizing. Um, we envision in the near future setting up a simple uh, app interface for our co-op members so they can just drop in stand boundaries and get back out these high quality LAI maps and use it for their planning. Um, and thirdly, on the university side, we're already moving forward with these Sentinel-based LAI maps to sort of plan out field trials that are specifically looking at managing forest land on a much more sensitive sort of fine scale basis. So we can tell which areas to fertilize, how much to fertilize, and where don't need fertilizing at all. Um, and this would hopefully help for us maximize that growth while minimizing the waste of uh, future resources, right? So ultimately our hope is that tools like this are helping to keep these forests working and working efficiently and help keep the strain off of other forests that should probably be best left alone. Um, with that, I need to acknowledge my collaborators on this. This is our contact and uh, happy to take questions or um, talk offline. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, and nice to see you here live. Uh, so my question for you is, how hard was it to get up to speed on TensorFlow and Keras for your work on generating these 10 meter um, LAI indices using Sentinel-2? So for those who are out there and perhaps are perhaps uh, advanced Earth Engine users, but are just getting started with um, frameworks like you know, deep learning in Earth Engine, are there any starting points that you'd recommend that helped you sort of you know, kick things off, get things started? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for uh, landing the pronunciation on my name. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, my background in this was, you know, I have a reasonably strong background in statistics, but I worked in R and I had really never played with Earth Engine or in Python or TF or anything like that before. So, um, the, you know, if I can soapbox for one second about this, what really let, let this project happen was the fact that, you know, I've, I've got a background in forestry, uh, but my collaborators, um, Val Pascarella and um, Chris Brown, they have these deep backgrounds in the remote sensing and the machine learning side. So it's that uh, merging of, you know, sort of interdisciplinary knowledge that I think it really like let this project sort of come to fruition um, because nobody can be an expert in everything. And I certainly am not. Um, but in terms of getting up to speed on the neural network, you know, it was Dr. Bascarella and Chris Brown that really built the model. And then it was me that came along and kind of, you know, suited it to purpose, did the training, that kind of stuff to even like get, you know, I, I got this off my shelf the other day to even get up to speed on what a neural network is and how this works. You know, we, we, we learned some basic machine learning stuff in the statistical realm, but deep learning is a big deal. But anyway, um, grokking deep learning as a book is a great way of getting into the, the concept of. How do you do neural networks in, in a Python environment like that? You know, other than that, like, I, I, I don't know what to say other than choose your battles. It's, a, there's, it's a, obviously it's a giant field and it's been there for forever. Um, but um, have smart friends also helps. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And have a clear, have a clear ask and a clear mission, what you're an objective, what you're trying to accomplish. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, I think we'll move on to our next speaker and hopefully I can, butcher your name a little bit less than I did in the opening. So I'd like to welcome Pedro Rodriguez Vega, uh, research scientist at the National Center for Earth Observation at the University of Leicester in the UK. Um, he's a researcher in the fields of remote sensing, forest ter terrestrial carbon, and vegetation structure with an emphasis on biomass. So uh, Pedro, uh, let's hear your talk. Take it away. Hi. I'm Pedro Rodriguez Vega, and I will present this study in about biomass dynamics in Africa on my behalf of my colleagues listed in this slide. And the forests on Africa are amongst the most uh, diverse on Earth. We have tropical moist broadleaf forests, savannas, dry forests, and they contain large uh, carbon stocks in the form of biomass. Biomass is a key component in the global carbon cycle. So biomass can be defined as the dry weight of vegetation. And more interestingly, 50% of this biomass weight can be considered to be carbon. At the same time, Africa stores 30% of this biomass in the form of carbon and contributes to 70% of the world deforestation carbon emissions. Despite this, the African continent is still one of the weakest link in our understanding of this carbon cycle. The Carbo Africa project, for example, estimated that the carbon balance in the sub-Saharan Africa is below one petagram of carbon per year, while climate models can estimate unrealistic large, large sinks of more than three petagrams of carbon per year, while other models even indicate that the carbon sink is declining or even turning to a source. So there is a lot of uncertainty. And so how can we improve this quantitative knowledge of the African carbon cycle? So we need better estimates of biomass, uh, of the amount and the spatial distribution uh, and the annual changes. At the same time, this is also a pressing issue because the world uh, prepares for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for its global stock take of the Paris Agreement. So our team implemented this approach in Google Earth Engine to compose of uh, canopy high modeling, biomass modeling, and biomass change mapping. The canopy high modeling uh, consisted of a machine learning random forest regression algorithm within a, within a spatial K4 cross-validation framework. This method allows us not to only generate predictions of canopy height at 100 meter pixel resolution, but as well the uncertainty of these estimates. At the same time, this spatial uh, component allows us to avoid problems. For this modeling, we use the canopy height estimated by the GDI sensor that we use as a reference for, for our modeling. We also use synthetic aperture radar, ALOS Pulsar and Pulsar 2 mosaics that has been uh, temporarily cross calibrated and we use optical-based Landsat percent three cover data. Um, this kind of behind model maps, um, Africa-wide, were transformed to biomass using empirical models that were developed using airborne-based biomass maps across Africa. And then we map, we map the changes of biomass across the continent uh, using the significant changes estimated using the uncertain characterization in the case of these disturbances. And in the case of the gain of the forest growth, we use the long-term significant slopes. Our accurate assessment include a large 
independent data set of in situ measurements from forest inventories, as well as different research studies in, in the continent. This is the kind of annual output that we will generate a biomass map at 100 meter resolution and the uncertainty maps, as well as the same resolution. We perform a multi temporal um, validation or curious assessment using this large data set of in situ plots you can see here on the bottom of the slide. Once we have a time series of biomass map, we can start to do our uh, more interesting analysis. For example, we can analyze uh, biomass chains, as you can see here in this slide in the small red square. Uh, we can look at the, how the biomass is changing, how the histogram is as this skew towards the left, the, the low biomass uh, ranges. We can look at continental-wide cumulative biomass chains, or even more interesting, we can look at annual biomass stock changes. We can see that during our period, the biomass net uh, change was positive. We have a what they call a, a positive net gain, but towards the end of our study period, this uh, change become negative. Our results then showed that during our study period, the above ground biomass stocks in Africa averaged to approximately 120.5 petagrams of biomass that is agree with previous studies. We, as mentioned before, we can ob observe this continuous increase in the annual rate of biomass loss. This seems to be due to the high deforestation rates that uh, occur during, study, during our study period in the Congo Basin. Uh, this is driving the annual biomass change or interannual biomass stock change from a net gain to a net loss. Um, the product developed during, or the products, the time series uh, of map developed during this study are being used by the CEOs Biomass Organization Activity Group in support of the goals of UNFCCC Global Stocktake Process of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. You can see more information in those links and also uh, you can visualize one of the maps. Uh, for more information, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, and welcome. So my question for you was, does the future availability of JEDI in Earth Engine um, assist in any of your workflows? And maybe this is a question for any other, other supporters tuning in, but how does this work continue beyond the current data availability in 2017 to support the Paris Global Stock Take? Uh, in 2023, and is there is there a need for additional ground truth validation data uh, to support this ongoing work? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the invite and for not butchering my name. <laughs> that, that, that was really nice. <laughs> or uh, the second time, yeah. maybe. <laughs> But yes, indeed. I mean, Jedi data, it's uh, it's invaluable uh, data that we are using for, for our studies, but not also Jedi. For example, we have also another satellite like it's called ISAT-2, and this has opened an unprecedented opportunity to acquire, you know, forest structural information at incredible quantities around the globe. So this is helping not only me, but the whole research community to circumvent one of these great problems that we have in this field of biomass, forests, and so on, that is the lack of reference data in places such as the Congo Basin, uh, Siberia, or even in the middle of the Amazon, where it's incredibly hard and costly to, to do this kind of field work. So unfortunately, the JEDI mission is, is, is about to finish. So the JEDI mission is a sensor in the International Space Station, and this soon will be replaced. So I think everybody that is using this data as me probably is quite disappointed. And I mean, as far as I know, uh, the JEDI team and probably a lot of uh, researchers um, are trying to convince key players to kind of extend uh, this mission. So, I mean, this is a call to everyone here that is maybe listening. If you are working or know someone in key organizations that can support this petition to extend the life of the JEDI mission, please, Please do transmit the message, and uh, at the same time, for this uh, biomass harmonization group that uh, I'm participating at the moment. So we are a, a big group of scientists, space agencies, ecologists, um, uh, forest monitoring agencies in country, and our aim is to harmonize uh, the different biomass maps that are at the moment. That sometimes agree, sometimes disagree, but we are trying to produce an harmonized product that will be used for. And the global stock take now in 2023, but obviously global stock take will be repeat every five years. So if someone can contribute with data uh, towards this, what we call the fourth mission, that is uh, to 
the several agencies are trying to support from the ESA Climate Change Initiative, the JDI team, or other forest networks, please uh, do so because it, it's, it's really useful and uh, we can do amazing things. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Pedro. And that's a fantastic call to action to our scientific community and anybody else tuning in who relies on biomass data. Next up, we're going to turn it over to Jen Hurd, who is a remote sensing scientist at the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. Uh, she's based in Calgary and she works on the recovery of mine sites in reclaimed areas in Alberta, Canada. Actually, her talk is about reclaimed mine sites. She works on a lot of other things, but this is what she's speaking to us today about. So let's hear her talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen and thanks for joining. I'm going to talk to you today about how we've been using Google Earth Engine to look at spectral recovery at some well sites and reclaimed mine areas in the Canadian oil sands. So the Canadian oil sands are in northeastern Alberta, which is located in western Canada. And this landscape, as you can understand, uh, is a rapidly changing landscape, not just with human activity, but also natural processes that are going on in the landscape. So up-to-date mapping and monitoring are really important for effective land and resource management in this environment. Now on the ground monitoring in the oil sands is ongoing and can be enhanced with broader scale remote sensing approaches. So for instance, the Landsat Satellite Archive offers us this multi-decadal look at longer term patterns in things like general vegetation regeneration on recovering human footprint features. Some of the previous work we've done has shown that with Google Earth Engine, we can effectively use those Landsat time series for looking at spectrally based recovery. And we did this with Harvest Series. You can see one of our uh, recent publications up here. And this is a tool that we built alongside a data set uh, in that work. And this was some cool stuff. We've had some local community groups use it to inform some of their citizen science uh, that's focused on ecological recovery in the foothills of Alberta. So now our current goal has been to adapt this approach and apply it to other types of human, foot, human footprint features. Now to do this, we've been looking at well sites and reclaimed mine areas. And the reason we chose these features is that they're large enough to be captured with 30 meter Landsat pixels and post disturbance reclamation is mandated by the province in those areas and practiced in those areas. So a quick look at our study area here in northeastern Alberta. You can see uh, the location of some of the reclaimed mine areas and some of the active and abandoned well sites in the oil sands area in northeastern Alberta there. So what we do is we take uh, an existing human footprint inventory that has polygons of these types of features and we bring it into Google Earth Engine and we compile a Landsat archive and we do some time series analysis with vegetation indices uh, in these areas. And we, out of that, we pull uh, some different types of metrics, things like the numbers of disturbances that we can detect with those spectral trajectories, uh, the total spectral changes, and especially the percent recovery. So the percent of the pre-disturbance spectral signals that have come back later on after uh, the human disturbances have happened. And then we can map those. So some of our preliminary results here, uh, looking at numbers of detected disturbances, we find in our reclaimed mine areas an average of almost two disturbances per feature. Uh, it's not surprising these features can have multiple disturbances happening uh, that we can detect in these areas. Active and abandoned well sites have uh, on average fewer numbers of disturbances in those areas, which reflects the processes that are going on in those, in those types of features. And looking at sort of end of time series spectral recovery, so that percent of that pre-disturbance signal that's coming back, our reclaimed mine areas show an average of 72.8% of that pre-disturbance signal coming back. This is lower in active well sites, uh, given that there are more active features, things are still going on in the landscape there, that's not surprising. And abandoned well sites show a much higher percent of that pre-disturbance signal coming back. And all of these patterns make sense uh, it's what, it's what we're expecting. And so that's telling us that what we're doing is, is showing some important patterns. So what's next for us? Uh, we would like to eventually expand this to the provincial level. Uh, we'd like to create some tools for visualization and exploration to go along with the data set. Here's an example of what that might look like. And we really wanna deepen our understanding of the links between the spectral recovery and on the ground observations, as well as with land cover. So ultimately we really wanna help answer questions like, what are the landscape level patterns of recovery? Uh, what areas may be under or overperforming? And then can we use these tools to identify areas that are, are on a trajectory towards future recovery? 
So that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to I'll look forward to answering your questions. Uh, you can also contact me there. I've got my email and my Twitter handle there on the bottom. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I was looking around some of the other work that ABMI does and noticed that ABMI scientists use biodiversity and technus index to monitor which species are increasing or decre decreasing or declining um, in intact landscapes as well as in uh, areas of a, of a human footprint. Um, and I was just curious whether you've also done correlations with the reclaimed mine sites and changes in the biodiversity and techness index. Thanks, Tanya. That's a really good question. Uh, and, and the short answer is no, we have not. <laughs> not yet. Uh, the biodiversity intactness uh, indices are, are one of those really well-established uh, products that ABMI has, has spent a lot of years putting work into and, and has developed and, and provides. And, and the work that I'm doing is, is still very much on the research and development side. Um, so we haven't yet gotten to that point of, of making those linkages, but uh, it's a fantastic idea. And it's something that I really hope that we're going to be doing, uh, doing someday. The next, the next step for us, I think, before we really get into those correlations is really understanding what the spectral signatures that we're seeing and, and how those are changing are relating to what's going on on the ground. That's something that uh, has been a bit of a challenge for us, but we're working on it uh, and working on building our, our that understanding because that's a really key piece of of this work. Um, but uh, but we're it's it's coming along, and I'm hoping that we're going to be making be able to make comparisons like that uh, in the in the future coming up. Fantastic! Thanks so much. Um, Next up, we are uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dave Theobald, who is a senior scientist at Conservation Planning Technologies and affiliate faculty at Colorado State University. Um, he is speaking to us today on global climate-based ecological systems. So take it away, Dave. Hi, I'd like to share with you a map of climate-based ecological systems that I've been working on. The conservation challenge that I've been addressing is uh, a urgent and really important one, and that is the area-based goals that are being called for by the Convention of Biodiversity and IUCN and other groups have been calling for protecting 30% of lands and waters by 2030. But they also are asking for them to be connected and to be ecologically representative. And it's this last one that I think is particularly uh, underappreciated, if you will. So how do we go about doing that right now? Well, typically we look at eco-regional boundaries and then assess them. These eco-regional boundaries typically are, are drawn and they're fairly at a course level. Other approaches have been to generate these eco-regional boundaries or clusters by using some clustering algorithms. But climate change in the dynamics that occur on, on the land, uh, as well as global uh, thinking globally and then acting locally, these really require, uh, a, I think, a different approach. And it really requires um, a comprehensive and very high resolution data set. So let me let me describe what um, I've been thinking about here and, and producing. So this is basically a five factors go into this uh, mapping effort. Top level is uh, climate. It's represented by Copenhagen uh, uh, climate regions, and these are represented for both the current conditions, current climate, as well as forecasted conditions out to the end of this uh, century, so 2100. Second level uh, in there is our domains, biogeographic domains. A third level is looking at landforms. So big, big broad landforms like mountains, hills, plains, et cetera. These are Hammond-esque uh, uh, or Hammond-like um, landforms. And I've developed a new approach to do this, this based on data driven and using some slope and distance algorithms and the higher resolution DEMs that we have available. A fourth layer is lithology. And this is, you know, essentially the top, top level, top layer of uh, geology that soils are 
roughly uh, based on. Um, I've used a downscaling approach and adjusted using some elevation. So the details are really, really important here to get to very detailed and management relevant uh, scales. Finally, local terrain is included because we know that microclimates pop out of, occur from uh, local terrain. And so I include hill slope processes and then also heat load kinds of effects. And this is leaning on borrowing from work that I produced a couple of years ago um, called Ecologically Relevant Geophysical Units. These are uh, available in Earth Engine right now. So this is what it looks like visually. So just sort of stepping through top left corner, climate regions. Um, this is for an area sort of centered on the Himalaya mountain range. Second one is uh, bringing on some of the landforms on top of that, uh, and then including lithology in there. And then finally, a fourth layer in there, uh, including terrain. Now, as you can imagine, there's a whole lot of detail here. And visually, it gets quite complex. So the way that I represent these, of course, is using some random, a random visualization of that. And this is the map of the global climate ecological systems. And in fact, there are 27,000 classes of these. So this is what it looks like. I produced a uh, or created a uh, app to be able to visualize this so that you can take a look at it and we'll be able to provide access to this data layer as well. So very quickly, this is what it looks like, obviously centered uh, in uh, Africa. Um, we have both the present climate and then forecasted climate. So you can see a bit of a change. I'm going to toggle between these. Um, and then let's go ahead and zoom in in an area and start to take a look at some of the details. So as you can, as you can see, um, a variety um, of the patterns that emerge, and these are patterns that are going to be, you know, biogeographical patterns that are going to be very important. And, and again, importantly, they, they represent a specific assumption about the climate. They don't represent a specific representation of what land cover is occurring there at a given time. And that's an important distinction. We can compare that to a few others. Um, probably the most uh, key one to do would be to compare it to uh, boundaries that are typically used and I've used in the past are uh, ecoregions safe from uh, Olson's work and, and uh, the Resolve work uh, by Dinnerstein et al. So um, that's it in a nutshell. Lots of, lots of details in here, uh, and I look forward to uh, sharing a discussion with you all. Thanks very much. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Um, fantastic talk. Uh, my question for you is, my gosh, I was exploring around this data set and it's like, it's like a work of art, you know, I could take screenshots from any part and post it on my, on my wall. So I guess the question for you is, how do you envision these, you know, local, regional or um, national level management decisions being inform informed by this rich and some may say complex data set? Yeah, <clears throat> well, thank you, Tanya, uh, for the invitation to participate. Um, and share some of my work. Yeah, yeah indeed, it's, it's complex uh, and as, as is nature. Um, and so the, the idea here really is to think about using this data, these data as a platform to then do analyses. And of course, that's what's so powerful about Earth Engine. Uh, I, I liken to, I think about this as the, there's sort of a conservation conundrum and that is you need to act locally um, but uh, uh, think about it globally and or perhaps at the scale of the distribution of those ecological systems. And so that's what this map is really providing that context. So two, uh, two examples of how we've used these data come to mind. First one is, is really um, thinking at a, a fairly small uh, scale, localized scale for Baez uh, National Park here in New Mexico, U.S., what we did there was really to identify locations or patches of uh, lower montane forests um, that are uh, exist today, looking forward to where they're likely to occur in the future um, to identify where to di direct actions. 
um, again, using very detailed data, 30 meter resolution uh, data. Uh, a second one is, is uh, thinking much more globally. So I've been working on uh, with some teams uh, to track conservation towards uh, post 2020 uh, Convention of Biodiversity goals like 30% by uh, 2030. The challenge there, of course, is how, uh, how do we represent uh, the ecological uh, representation aspect? How do we measure that? So that's what this uh, data set is really geared towards by using some uh, diversity kinds of metrics, Shannon's information, those kinds of things. Uh, so it really, uh, I think, establishes a foundation to be able to do these analyses, lots of different ways to, to begin to use those. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I, I, the, the importance of ecological representation and ecological integrity cannot be underestimated for some of these large global initiatives. Mm. So let's, um, let's welcome back everybody onto the screen. And uh, thanks again for all of your fantastic talks. Um, we're going to switch over now and look at some of the questions and answers from folks in the audience. And we've got some really good questions. Uh, you can keep them coming. Um, and enter enter in more as you uh, as they arise, and I also encourage uh, our speakers to ask questions of each other as well. So the first one is for Ricardo from Emil Sherrington, uh, who actually spoke on Tuesday as well. So a plug for Emil's talk uh, on Tuesday. He says, "Nice presentation, Ricardo. Um, since your Siraj X uh, or." Well, you can pronounce it better than I can. I'm going to stop with the pronunciation today. Since the Siraj X platform uh, leverages the Copernicus Sentinel-1 collection in Earth Engine, out of curiosity, is your ability to detect deforestation affected by the malfunctioning of the Sentinel-1B satellite, or is the data over the Amazon mostly Sentinel-1A? Okay, thanks for the question. And uh, uh, you're right. It's it's mostly 1A on the Amazon. So as for now, we uh, we haven't noticed any uh, any problems with uh, with the imagery images on the uh, on our area. Uh, the problem will be uh, if ESA decides to change its uh, trajectory to cover for the loss of the the 1B. So we'll have to see and wait. As for now, it's okay. Pedro, did you have any? You were nodding. You looked like you wanted to chime in on new. No, yeah, I, I completely agree. One of the plans that they are contemplating at the moment is to to change all the orbit plans to try to compensate for those areas that are not covered, and try to launch as soon as possible the next Sentinel One, maybe. But they have now in store this one, and probably they will uh, launch it in advance. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Could I could I quickly ask? I, I've been curious about the you know I use multispectral stuff usually. What what kind of extra information are you guys in terms of forest information? Are you getting out of the the radar platforms like that? This is a question for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, either. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically, what it gives you uh, synthetic aperture radar will depends of the wavelength that you are using. What we prefer for biomass is the bigger the wavelength, the better because if you have a really small wavelength, for example, like Sentinel-1 is relatively small. So the wavelength will interact with the leaves in the trees and they will send back the signal. So you are not gonna really, I mean, you're gonna see a little bit of surface roughness and so on, but we're interested more in a little bit of bigger wavelength. So we'll go through the leaves, the leaves will become kind of invisible, okay? And we'll interact with branches and with, uh, with trunks. So and it give, will give us this information a little bit about the volume of vegetation. So for me, things like biomass, uh, density, the dry, dry weight of vegetation, uh, is incredibly highly correlated with with uh, the volume of scattering that you will get from the from the radar. So yeah, that's that's the kind of information I'm much more interested in, with. Uh, but yeah, radar can give you other kind of information as well in the kind of the surface roughness and uh, even they have a really high uh, sensitivity to soil moisture and so on. Yeah. Uh, for, in our case, we're actually looking for uh, as, as the fast alert uh, of uh, deforestation. And um, the, the problem with the optical sensors are the clouds. So this data set is really important for the, the rainy season. Uh, 
but uh, yeah, it doesn't have the real good uh, spatial resolution as Sentinel-2, but uh, yeah, it, it goes through the clouds. So that for us is what <laughs> Maybe less of a problem in the southeast U.S. <laughs> as in as in the Amazon, <laughs> but still good, still certainly cloudy. Yeah, but but, but in areas like uh, we work in forests, you know, in, in Africa, or it just, it's always cloud cover. I mean, you cannot imagine how difficult sometimes it is just to find a cloud-free images of Gabon, for example. It's almost an impossible mission. So radar is amazing in that sense. Yeah, and there are certain areas on the in the on the globe that are pride themselves on having never been spotted by a satellite because they're under persistent <laughs> cloud cover. <laughs> this part's in Borneo. Um, okay, we have another question from Emil uh, Charrington uh, for Andrew. And he says, nice presentation, Andrew. Andrew, in addition to the Sentinel-2 data, is your deep learning work also integrating the NASA JEDI data for LAI estimation, Leap Theory Index estimation? So the quick answer on that is no, we, we didn't um, use any of the JEDI data for our work. I am not as up to speed on the, like how exactly JEDI, what it looks like, but my understanding is, is that it's a sort of built up picture over time. So you're not getting a, a sort of snapshot of your LIDAR signature, which is we kind of need a snapshot because those canopies are pretty dynamic and we'd like to be able to predict them at a particular point in their growth cycle, their annual growth cycle. So we kind of need the the snapshot that aerial LIDAR provides us because it happens in a day or two. Um, the other thing about it too, is that for the kinds of, to be able to manage to this signal, you need pretty accurate, um, uh, you need just a, a, like a really high data density, right? Like our, our specific LIDAR retrieval is really built for the kinds of data densities, the point cloud densities that you get with aerial LIDAR. Um, and I don't know how that would adapt to the space born, like what that sort of density is. And, and again, the spatial resolution part of that is also a factor. You know, we need to be able to see these plots at the scale that they're at. And, and you know, I, I, I don't know what, what is Jedi is a hundred meters or something like this. Like that's starting to, to look a little big. Um, so, the, so the answer there is no, haven't, but I definitely would be interested to know more about how it works. I haven't looked at it yet. So. Good for you guys, the Jedi guys that have delved into that. Yeah, yeah and there's sort of a follow-up from, also from Emil, also about Jedi. <laughs> we were just joking, Emil, we, we should just join, uh, you know, have you host you and join <laughs> to join this, this session with us. That would be great. Um, but also for uh, Ricardo, uh, I mean, sorry, for Pedro, apologies. Um, in addition to Jedi Spaceborne LiDAR data, did you evaluate the ISAT2 data also from Emil? Um, yeah, I mean, we did initial evaluation about uh, ISAT, but somehow ISAT um, uh, is a little bit different type of data because you will only usually get the first and the last return, as I understand. Um, it's slightly different of Jedi. And because we were working in Africa uh, where uh, Jedi is actually specialized for the um, all tropical uh, forests as it's in the International Space Station is going, you know, in the kind of an equator kind of orbit looking at the at the tropical areas. So we decide to go uh, with Jedi data. Um, nevertheless, I have to say that, for example, another teams I know of um, from the University of Maryland, Laura Duncanson from the Jedi team, John Armstrong and so on, they are working with ISAT2 to, to develop, using a similar approach to this one, they are developing a um, biomass map also for the boreal uh, regions of the world, and they are using ISAT2. Excellent. And the next one is also about Jedi, um, to me. Uh, from Patrick Burns, um, and it's thanks to the Earth Engine team for ingesting the massive Jedi data set. Is there an update on when the level two products will officially be available in Earth Engine? Um, so it's coming soon. Uh, we've got points for L2A and L2B. Um, L2A is also rasterized into monthly images. Um, stay tuned for the update on when it's going to become publicly available in the Earth Engine data catalog. Uh, we're actively working on it, and um, yeah, everybody's clearly really excited about Jedi. So, um, there, uh, you know, as soon as we've got it, we'll we'll let every let everybody in the Earth Engine community know. Uh, okay, next up is from Rebecca Edwards to Jen. Um, she says, "Sorry if you mentioned this, but what algorithm did you use for your time series? 
And also, how did you validate the time series? That's a, a really good question. Uh, so in terms of algorithms, so what we did was we created uh, an annual sort of a, I guess, kind of like a best pixel composite. We used uh, summertime median composite uh, of our, our compiled Landsat data. Um, so going back to 1984 up to 2018. And the reason we use 2018 is because our human footprint inventory database that we have is for 2018. Um, and so we have this annual composite uh, of Landsat images over our area. And we pulled out something called the normalized burn ratio. It's a spectral index uh, using uh, near infrared and short wave infrared. Uh, and it really helps us to look at changes in, in, in the vegetation, especially in those forested areas. Uh, it doesn't tend to saturate as much as something like an NDVI, which is very, also very popular. Um, so we've, that's, we, we look at that over time on a per pixel basis. When we were doing this with harvest areas, which is where we started um, because they're nice big features and it was easy to see uh, kind of what was going on in the landscape there, um, we used the land trender algorithms. Um, and those helped us to, does a, it does a temporal segmentation on the per pixel time series so that we can get a, a um, an idea of when the time series is when we have a drastic change, but kind of minimizes some of the short term noise that that we see in the time series. When we move that over to these reclaimed mine areas and, and well sites, but especially the reclaimed mine areas, the processes going on in the landscape are, are different. Um, you'll have some clearing going on and then there'll be sort of a break and you'll have vegetation come back and then you'll have another clearing come come along and so it's different from a harvest area and we actually found that the land trender algorithm didn't work so well in that instance um because it then it it took out some of that short term the short term changes that we really wanted to to be able to see in the time series um so we actually just take the the time series of of landsat annual composites in that case with with the spectral index and and we just we we look for where where the, uh, a certain level of cha has changed, you know, from one year to the next to look at where disturbance has been happening, at least looking at it spectrally, uh, and then looking at how those those signals have changed over time. Um, I hope that uh, that answers answers your question. I'm, I'm sorry if it didn't. <laughs> it's, it's actually not a terribly complex process, but it's been really great to be able to do this with Earth Engine over Alberta. Alberta is such a uh, a large area, at least for harvest areas, and then we'll we'll be scaling up with these other types of features. Excellent, thank you, hey, Jen. I'd like to follow up with that. Yeah, really interesting work, and I'm I'm wondering if that kind of methodology either you have applied or could be applied to a lot of the more linear kind of infrastructure uh, kinds of changes, in particular, you know, seismic lines or uh, pipelines or other kinds of those linear features that you know have uh, uh, are are quite widespread, amazingly widespread uh, in Alberta. They are. You're you're right, uh, and that's something that uh, some of my colleagues and and uh, some of the projects that I've been uh, collaborating with and working with are really want to be able to do. The tricky part, of course, with Landsat those those linear features, especially those seismic lines you mentioned are only, you know, sometimes two to five, maybe 10 meters uh, in the forest. And so Landsat really, it gives us that nice time series, but it really doesn't work for those features spatially. Uh, so something, you know, they're, I have colleagues that have been starting to explore. They want to explore what Sentinel might be able to do. And then, and then something like Planet Labs, uh, other high resolution imagery, to maybe do, I don't know, for some space for time type analyses and things like that. Um, those are, yeah, those are really key features that that uh, are important for restoration and and uh, and forest recovery and things in in Alberta and a lot of places. And and yeah, it's something we'd like to do. And and with the tools, specific tools I've built, we haven't, we can't quite do that. But we're hoping that they can translate to other types of imagery to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And Dave, the next question is uh, for you from Emil. Uh, it's a two-part question. He says, nice talk. Beyond the app, will the data output also be available? And number one, number two is, have you considered 
modeling how the GCES boundaries might change based on the CC scenario data available, for example, through the World Clim data set? Yeah, great question. Uh, so yes, the data uh, will be available um, and uh, contact me and I'm, I'm happy to make those available. Uh, perhaps I can even, uh, we can make an update to, the, to some of the website associated with the series here. Um, yeah, so, th so the climate change uh, embedded in the projections that I'm using, the forecast, sorry, from Beck, uh, their data set, they did include uh, climate change, uh, various scenarios and, and looked at the variability among those and sort of, you know, got a, a consensus version of them. So that's, that's embedded in there. There's certainly a lot more to do. Um, you know, maybe even disentangle those. So you're looking at individual ones, uh, the world Clim data set. Um, absolutely. I've been looking at those as well. Uh, another plug, uh, perhaps, uh, or encouragement to, uh, um, there, there are some world Clim data up on earth engine. There's a new version out there. That would be awesome to see out there uh, as well. It's really invaluable data, the world, world CLIM data. So in general, um, uh, I think that there's a lot to unpack there in the initial uh, data sets that are available. It's uh, embedded uh, in the sense that it's working off of a best uh, or consensus um, data set of, uh, that combines the various forecasts. But yeah, there, there's a lot of additional analyses that could be done there. Excellent, thanks so much. Um, question from Emil for Jen. Uh, in addition to the Landsat time series, are you also integrating Sentinel-2 into the analyses? We, we short answer is no, we haven't yet. Uh, that's something that I think I would really like to explore more um, given that higher spatial resolution that we would be able to get. Uh, so. We haven't yet, but it's something I, I I would like to be able to do, especially for some of these other features, like the well sites that that I talked about in the presentation. There, you can cover them with Landsat pixels, but some of them are still quite small, and it would be nice to be able to have uh, a Sentinel level resolution on those. Awesome. And I guess I have one more question for you guys all before we're out of time. Um, it seems like there's just a whole wealth of sensor data coming online. There's a lot of um, a lot of you know data sources out there. I'm curious from all of you what what is the sensor data that you're most excited about? It could be hyperspectral, could be lidar, could be a con just a continuation of the Jedi mission. Um, could be uh, you know could be drone data, could be more ground validation to say to get like below ground biomass samples, biodiversity data, biodiversity data. Um, if you can take uh, like 30 seconds each to answer that, what, what would you vote for? Can I go first? Yep. <laughs> definitely, definitely drones with infrared night vision to get uh, illegal loggers and, uh, you know, Ill illegal activities. That, that, that's something that we, we look forward to use. Excellent. Pedro, I can imagine what you're going to say. <laughs> well, uh, you might be surprised. So aside from the night that I already mentioned, uh, the most exciting for me will be synthetic aperture radar. And I'm thinking about two sensors. One is the biomass that is a P-band sensor. So we'll have, you know, be able to measure biomass at levels that we, we never did before. At, landscape level. And the other one is NISAR as well, that this will be an L1 from NASA. So we'll have an amazing time series of cloud-free data that is highly correlated with biomass, carbon, and forest parameters. Awesome. Anyone else? Uh, I will say uh, structural information from LIDAR, from other, uh, other platforms. Uh, We've worked with some Jedi, uh, some of my colleagues have worked with Jedi to help with some of their mapping, um, but it's not it's not focused on on those northern latitudes. So having having something that would be uh, a really high quality focused for those northern latitudes would be really helpful for for the work I do, as well as for the wetland wetland work and, and peatlands and all sorts of things that are going on where I am. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'll I'll just say, Jed, I um, I think that's super important. Um, though I I really like Jen's point about um, you know understanding the northern and southern you know higher latitudes uh, is is very important and is only going to be more important uh, as we move into the future with climate dynamics. So, um, you know, hoping to to move towards coverage uh, there with various um, platforms. Excellent. Thank you. And Andrew, any final uh, plugs for any sensor data? I, you know, I, I, there's, there's been talk of a orbital hyperspectral. I, I would love to try hyperspectral, but, um, you know, there's something about just the, the consistency, the reliability of these multispectral platforms like Sentinel-2 and like Landsat, the fact you have these consistent time series, it's all there and it's close Hi. together. You know, like if, if I was buying a satellite, I'd just buy Sentinel-2C or 2D or 2E, you know, just get the... <laughs> Get the revisits time up, you know, that would be mm -hmm. also great, you know. Fantastic. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, I want to thank you for joining our session. I want to extend a special thanks to all of our speakers. Um, an extra special thanks for Emil for all of your questions and everybody else who, uh, who asked questions on the platform. Um, we hope you're inspired to get some fresh ideas to take to your own research. So thanks again and stay tuned for the next uh, series of lightning talks in a few weeks. Goodbye for now, everyone.